first episode looking at a contemporary sitcom, we discuss the good, the bad, and the medium as we delve into the phenomenon that is The Good Place. And holy mother forking shirt balls, Empire Magazine's Chris Hewitt joins us as we chat shrimps, shirt, and sitcoms. That sounds like a mouthful. That's ethics, Bench. Judgecast. Hello and welcome to Judgecast with myself, Joe Bowden, and this guy, Jay Taylor. This week, we continue our State of the Sitcom miniseries, dissecting the entire sitcom genre from its early days up to the most current slices of TV rib ticklers. Holy forking shirt balls, do we have a special episode for you today, as we are joined by a solitary guest of Lethal Cunning, host of the award-winning Empire podcast, the melodious voice of Empire's movie morning news on Alexa, and the only man other than John Barnes who still remembers all the words to the World in Motion rap verse. It's only bloody Chris Hewitt. Oh, my God. <laughs> I think you've made promises I can't keep. My word. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Lie. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed. I, where did you get the world of motion thing from? I guess I, that's, I, that's not true. I, I don't mean, know that. It's maybe... literally the only football reference I have. So. Oh, that's all right. Thank God. I know, I know the words to the Anfield rap, which is uh, the song that the Liverpool FC squad released as their FA Cup final single. So back in the day, when teams used to reach the FA Cup final, they would and used to release songs. They would record songs, and yeah. but they would record cover versions of stuff and terrible, terrible cover versions where they used they to did, sing yeah. as, a, as a choir. But what Liverpool did in 1988 was they went one step further and they actually wrote and recorded their own song called Anfield Rap, which was written by one of the players, Craig Johnson, who fact fans. Went on, after he retired, he retired from football quite young, um, became a surfer, became a bit of a, a wanderer, uh, invented the Predator football boot, which revolutionized football boots. So he was a bit of a master of all trades, and a bit of, you know, but he mastered them. He wasn't even just a jack, he mastered all the trades. And so he wrote this song, Anfield Rap. It is one of the worst songs ever written, but I, I love it, and I know almost every single word. I can't believe that a footballer wrote one of the worst songs ever written. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's truly it's truly tremendous. Okay, so obviously you're the host of the Empire podcast. Yes. Um, I don't really think that needs an introduction, but for anyone who does live under a rock or mm-hmm. you know arrive back from space like yes. Iron yeah. Man or something, uh-huh. can you tell us a bit about you and the show? Okay, uh, I am the host of the Empire podcast. The Empire podcast is the podcast arm of the world's biggest movie magazine, and we've been running now for about seven years and. Uh, Every week, myself and a couple of our colleagues uh, of such lethal cunning get together in a booth and we talk about films, we review films, we talk about the week's movie news, uh, we have a lot of nonsensical, I hate the word banter, but banter, and uh, we interview big name guests every single week and we do a whole bunch of other things as well. We do interview specials and spoiler specials, which is uh, the thing I really love doing, where we drill deep down into big blockbusters, and, and sometimes smaller, uh, more independent movies as well uh, with the, the writers or the directors or sometimes writers and directors uh, or producers, and uh, those are great. And Empire is the world's biggest movie magazine. It's been going for a long, long time, and I've been working for it for a long, long time. So that's me in a nutshell. And have, like you've done like the first podcast documentary from my, I don't, I don't know, maybe there are others, but with the Avatar one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, because we're 30 years old this year. So we decided to, uh, we pushed the boat out in terms of we've embraced, we've anointed 30 directors that we think are the the most forward thinking, the most visionary, the most innovative, or the ones who are having, who've had real sort of seismic impact upon cinema uh, Mm. in our lifetime. And uh, so we, 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 a lot of those directors we've interviewed and shot for the magazine. but we've decided to try and push the boat out in terms of the podcast as well. So we are doing what I hope is a series of podcast documentaries, or as I've called them, podumentaries. Um, <laughs> and the first one was with Jim Cameron, James Cameron himself. And we sat down, we had a good old natter about Avatar. So these aren't spoiler specials. These, these yeah. are um, long form stories of the film, the making of the film, the, the, conceptualization of the film and it's um they, and putting it in a bit of context as well how it did uh, upon release etc cetera, etc cetera. so really enjoyed doing that with uh, with jim cameron and we're hoping to do some more over the next uh, few months brilliant Ooh, it, i'm looking forward to it yeah it's so interesting like especially for a film that i wasn't 
super excited about Unreleased. Like, I think it was one of those films you saw at the cinema yeah. because of its spectacle. But actually then hearing the whole story behind it and the kind of seed of the gener- that how it was generated and then and it actually made me like it even more if that makes sense like it, it it gave me so much more clarity to the whole yeah well everything avatar and may, may, dare i say it maybe a little bit excited about two three four and five whatever. six five, seven, seven. Yeah. How many are there? <laughs> there's another 23 on the way um <laughs> no honestly that i that is not the first time i've heard that reaction and that's absolutely not why we we did it we we uh, we did it because it is, you know, the biggest film of all time. And um, Jim Cameron is one of our favorite filmmakers. And, you know, I prefer other movies of his. I prefer, well, pretty much every movie of his. But <laughs> I still like Avatar a lot. Uh, but the story of Avatar and the story of how he made it and the drive and the determination and the vision he had to realize, well, his vision over a nearly 30-year period and to revolutionize cinema and to drag 3D kicking and screaming into the now and actually make it relevant... I thought all mm. that stuff was fascinating, and uh, and I've heard a lot of people say the same thing that it made them reevaluate the film because the film gets written off a lot. It becomes it's become something of a punchline over the last yeah. few years. Even just the other week, I saw someone on Twitter going, "Can you remember such a a, a big film having such little cultural impact uh, and such a small cultural footprint as Avatar? You know, can you name even three <laughs> Avatar characters?" Um, it just so happens I can. But you know, yeah. I'm I'm weird. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of people have said that also it's made them excited for Avatars two, three, four, and five, and that's where they're stopping. Um, yeah, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was that, that that was an unintended but welcome side effect. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, interesting to take mediums and reshape them, mm. much like I feel <laughs> Michael Schur has done. Segway. <laughs> oh my word, that was excellent. Yeah. I feel that you've you come on to talk about The Good Place. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that really hit me when it when it started was I was expecting just the next Roseanne, you know, just next a tradition. <laughs> so I don't know why that one came to the front of my mind. Wow. Um, but yeah, the next kind of standard format, you know, two camera mm-hmm. sitcom. Mm. And so to have something that just arrived that completely threw me and yeah, it was just a massive curveball in terms of what it did, what it did for sitcoms. Um, this is actually the first uh, sitcom we're doing uh, that we're recording on State the Sitcom that is is currently showing. Yeah, I was mm. going to say on TV, but it's not. It's TV in America, but over here, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's Netflix and stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, on those platforms. Yeah, so um, I think we should just make this clear that there will be spoilers. Oh yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> But if you're not up to date on The Good Place, then what the fuck have you been doing, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what the fork have you been yeah, doing? Yeah, what the fork. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> but just before we get on to The Good Place, what's been your relationship with sitcoms over the years, Chris? Because mm. I think so many people, it is seen as a kind of old thing. You know, I brought up Roseanne as my first point of contact for some reason. Mm. But over the years, how have you, how have sitcoms shaped you and your TV watching experience? Yeah, sitcoms are huge for me. Uh, they, and they have been... From the off, I've been a huge comedy fan since I was a, a kid. I think I gravitated very, very much, even as a, as a kid. I have very, very strong memories of watching little bits and snatched bits and pieces of Monty Python. And I know that's not a sitcom, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> on, on TV, while well, my mum and dad, and who never quite got the, uh, the, the strain of humour that the Pythons peddled, they kind of disapproved of Python and stuff like that. So I think I maybe gravitated towards it. And I remember, but also we love stuff in our household communal experiences like only fools and horses i had a lovely yeah. time the other week i went to see the only fools and horses uh, musical in central oh. london which was tremendous fun i have to say you know I, I was slightly concerned and nervous going in um yeah but i really loved only fools and horses and i think the sitcom at its absolute best you know it, it is that old thing it can make you laugh and it can make you cry and only fools and horses uh, has done that but i like to think that you know i, I also love stuff growing up like Obviously, Black Adder, um, mm-hmm. Black Adder goes fourth is the, the pinnacle of that show for me. We have we've recently, uh, yeah, recorded a sitcom special on that one. So. Oh, <laughs> can't wait for that. Uh, you know, Faulty Towers. You know, obviously, you know that. But I was also someone that I would just pretty much watch any sitcom that came down mm. the uh, came down the pike. So 
I will watch things like I am. I have seen so haunt me. I have uh, so help me. I have seen so haunt me. Um, <laughs> I would watch things like there was Northern Irish sitcoms, things like there was a, a Northern Irish sitcom years and years ago called Foreign Bodies, which really tried to tackle the sectarian divide, but with humor that was lovely and very really? very people have seen it. Um, never, yeah, Father Ted, things like that. Oh, Classic, you yeah. know, American sitcoms, you know. Frasier, Cheers, yeah. uh, Roseanne, as you say, I worship at the altar of friends. I think it is absolutely phenomenal. You know, and then going through even to, you know, sitcoms today where, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Mike Shura verse is, is extraordinary. <laughs> you know, Parks and Rec. And I've recently been with my wife. I've been introducing her to, um, and if anyone was listening to the Empire podcast, yes, drinking game. And... Um, <laughs> I, she had never seen the American version of The Office before, and so we're doing a massive rewatch for me. But, oh my god, uh, I'm so jealous! First watch for her, and we're loving it. But we're up up to season seven, and this is the point where we're kind of going not so sure Ooh. whether we want to proceed at this point. You it's, know, it, it's worth it for moments after that, but yeah. it does. I, I I continue with it because of my love for the characters, not so much for the love of the writing at that point yeah i think but I, I, yeah yeah it's, i'm just i'm just very loyal and i'm a completist yeah so <laughs> that's interesting that is that's yeah i don't i don't know if i'm a completist in that way you could end it so perfectly with michael saying goodbye to pat you know that that is so beautiful mm. then we're just giving spoilers to all the shows <laughs> <laughs> why not screw it if your wife's listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, um, and there's 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 loads of there's loads of sitcoms like that where I kind of you know I just fell out of love with them a little bit. Frasier, I don't know mm. whether I've seen the last season and a half of Frasier, and uh, even now and again there are odd episodes like you know something like The Simpsons. I watched an episode of The Simpsons the other day uh, from one of the great seasons, season eight. It was Homer's Enemy. I was going, wow. I've never seen this before, and it's one of the one of the uh, the most contentious and most notorious episodes but so certain things will fall through the cracks but uh you know i'll get them in the end but i think that that's what's nice about sitcoms isn't it it's often especially i feel with those ones that you mentioned so the the older kind of british ones and some of the american ones for me something like 2.4 children when i was growing oh up. oh my god yeah it was, you just watched it it didn't matter it wasn't there was no ongoing storyline really so mm. you just switched in, in. some weeks yeah. and some weeks you'd miss it and, stuff. Mm. And, that's, and, that, and that's the beauty of a sitcom right it's exactly. the whole concept is that everything writes itself at the end <laughs> which is interesting because the good place completely like knocks that on their head oh yeah and go, cause yeah with, with the whole the, the concept of having a cliffhanger each mm. episode is is just so so fresh and different and so you do have to watch this one from beginning to end otherwise it makes no sense <laughs> yeah you're like, what the fuck is going on <laughs> <laughs> what the fork what the fork is going on, going on? Usually, I, I, I would be in the bad place <laughs> <laughs> i'm as potty mouth as anybody but yeah when, when we're talking about the good place i think i have to respect the more mother, mother forking intent of uh, of mike sure um, yeah, i need to get on brand <laughs> yeah have you listened to the good place the podcast we yes I love, yes. I love I love that podcast. I think it's 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 great. Uh, little baby, maybe a little bit self congratulatory in the third season. Yes, maybe, but <laughs> you know we'll get onto that. I'm sure. Uh, but I love the fact yeah. that you know every time someone swears, they just drop in Kristen Bell. Although there was an episode where Jamila Jamil was on it, and uh, she was swearing up a storm in her British accent, and. I'm pretty sure she said fuck in a British accent, but it, they didn't catch it because of her accent. Yeah. So <laughs> check that one out. Fact fans. I go like back. when she's on there. Love it. She's very candid. Oh, and, uh, yeah. 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 She's amazing. I think that's the moments when that, that podcast really works is when it's not the self congratulatory It's very much the experience of it. Like finding out that, you know, especially with the season three, that like that pilot, they, they, they didn't really film each with each other. And you, it was the type of thing I just hadn't, realized and then just hearing the pilot for for season three. Oh, so the and first hear, episode of yeah right okay sorry and i imagine it was the same for the early episodes because there wasn't that much interaction with the main cast mm. in those first few episodes mm. and so it was just really interesting like those moments of just finding out yeah i, I literally saw three quarters of the episode for the first time when i was watching it on tv and it was like that's a, that's a nice kind of thing to yeah, it's a nice to insight to, to yeah. be able to get that yeah yeah especially like, if you're interested in how things are made which you know if you're into film and tv in the kind of mm. ways that we all are it's just that thing well, you want to know completed. how was it made what was it done what's all that you know and so that it's got that lovely 
insight. Yeah. And especially having Sean's as the host. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sean, what's Sean. his name? Sean. Yeah. From Sean. the bad place, yeah. Yes. I'm just using character names. <laughs> Sean from the bad place. Uh, I will remember his name at some point. All the names of everybody who's involved with The Good Place, apart from Mike Shure and Kristen Bell and now Jamila Jamil, have just gone out of my head. Manny, yeah. Manny Yacinto. There's another one. I've got him. He's good. Yeah. William Jackson yeah. Harper. It's all coming back to me now. Yeah. Yeah. It's all coming back to me now. That Ted, Ted, Ted Danson guy, he's quite famous, right? Yeah. Ted, Ted Danson. Hang on, I'm going to Google that. Ted. Ted. Ted Tedithy, Tedithy Danson. Tedithy Danson. <laughs> to give him his full name. Uh, yeah, he's pretty good. He's pretty. Oh, he's the star of Becker. Uh, I've just looked yeah. it up now. Yes. Is this his breakout role? Love Becker. <laughs> yeah, this is the one. Finally, it's, it's, it's working out for him. But you're absolutely right. Uh, going back to, um, just for, very quickly, just going back to the idea of sitcoms and, and how they were very important for me growing up. I think even, mm. even as, a, as a kid, I kind of latched on to the idea that sitcoms were written by mostly over here, certainly one person. So even as a kid, I would go, Oh my God. Okay. So, um, that is a Simon Nye sitcom or that's a John Sullivan sitcom or, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would, I would find or Roy Clark sitcom even, you know, I don't, I don't look down my nose at all at last the summer wine. So (laughs) yeah, genuinely one of the greatest sitcoms, one of the greatest um, sitcom themes of all time. And I quite enjoyed it over Sunday nights. The the longest running TV show ever. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, zombie, zombie combo, zombie Clegg and zombie foggy (laughs) will outlive us all. I'm sure. And, um, you know, I, and obviously the American way of writing sitcoms is very, very different. It's very, very team based. It's very much about the writers' room. But there's something about Mike Sure as well. There's a, a a thread of 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 intelligence. There's a thread of uh, warm heartedness as well that runs through all his sitcoms. Um, maybe not so much The Office. But that's not really his. Uh, no. Then you have Parks and Rec, and obviously Brooklyn Nine Nine, and and oh, now right. this as well, which is really ultimately about what it's like to be human. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that you, you kind of focus on Michael Schur there. I, I really enjoyed elements of Parks and Rec. Mm-hmm. I think it's a it's a brilliant show when it's when it at, it, at its pin, at its peak, it's absolutely up there with the best. It just flounders, I think, a lot in certain certain storylines and stuff like that it gets lost in itself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's got that enjoyable you know, and the thing with things like friends and american sitcoms i find is that you can just get lost in the characters you yes. could just the office could just keep going for 20 seasons because you are kind of i just i'll, I'll watch You're invested. yeah i'll yeah. watch stanley you know be be annoyed at whichever boss is in the office i don't care if michael's got it's it's a really <laughs> interesting thing and the thing that I think Parks and Rec and then Brooklyn Nine Nine took a little bit longer for me to get into, mm-hmm. I think because it was more in the in the earlier seasons. Andy shit. Samba, Andy Samba, is, yeah, it's very focused on him, and then it embraces the. You mean when they realise it's actually an Andre Brower vehicle? Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, they they get that ensemble thing, and it, it really gets into its gear when they're all firing on all cylinders. Yeah, and this the good place. This I really feel like it's it's the idea behind it that that sells it for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's an incredibly complex idea. Like, yeah. oh, we're going to boil down all of like ethics and philosophy mm-hmm. and put it into a sitcom, and also talk about like religion mm-hmm. and like everything, and it's going to be funny. Like on paper, this sounds so confused. Oh my god, I'm mm. I'm amazed that it's so popular. But as you say, it, it's it's got this warmth and this mm. intelligence, but it's not too intelligent. Like in the way that Frasier always, Frasier always used to make you think that, oh, you were being clever because you got the joke, but it was like really base. <laughs> um, the same kind of thing. Yeah. It, I just don't understand how they've managed to do that, no. to boil it down to something so easily digestible. I think it's about the tone of the show from the off. And I think Drew Goddard directed the pilot and he, he, really, he really set the tone for the show, which is jaunty. Uh, I can see how some people might think it's cloying and maybe annoying, but uh, it moves at a fair old lick. It's yeah. really bright and really colorful. The characters are so warm and rich and nicely drawn, and it really does. It moves at a fair old lick, and it doesn't insult your intelligence, uh, but it takes you by the hand as well. And one of yeah. the interesting things listening to the good uh, place of the podcast is that most of the writers don't really have a huge grounding in philosophy. 
Um, and Mike Schur himself kind of had to start learning this stuff. You know, he had, he, I think he had a, a college level understanding of philosophy and he's really delved into it in a big way. Um, and it's, it's a show that's made me go, oh, maybe I should start reading philosophy. Um, I don't, obviously, because <laughs> I end up reading comics or something instead. But in a way, isn't that philosophy? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's I'm rereading Why the Last Man, and that is like hugely, hugely philosophical. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely is. Why the Last Man? Yeah. Why <laughs> the Last Man? Um, <laughs> so, but I, th- I think it is about that because otherwise, you know, it could be really, really hard to take, and it could be bombarding you and, and beating you over the head with this the mm. philosophy stuff uh, all the time. But also, it, 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 they find a really lovely way to weave it into the fabric of the show, which is that each episode is essentially an ethics problem or an ethics conundrum or a lesson. And one of the main characters, Chidi, is teaching, mostly yes. in the first two seasons, Eleanor, something about ethics. And therefore, yeah. by extension, us as well. Mm. I like that we're closely aligned to Eleanor Shellstrop in this like where where the dirt bags is that? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, yeah. there's a really interesting way of looking at it in that you've got this kind of uh, insight into philosophy, this insight, but it's also a really accurate depiction of sitcoms themselves. Mm. So you've got that kind of the audience and the, the kind of ethics behind sitcoms and breaking the mold of sitcoms and getting out of the kind of stagnation of sitcoms. So Michael is uh, creating this new world that's not not like the rest of it. And then you've got Sean as the bad place, kind of the overseeing producers and the, the network giving giving yeah. all of the notes and everything to him. And, and you know, yeah. oh, it's not going to work. Your, your, your second iteration is not going to work or you've got, to, you've got to keep it the same, but a bit more and stuff like that. And it, it really kind of grows in that. And you've got Ted Danson, who is you know one of the if, if you had a a, a a star wars poster style of, of sitcoms i think ted danson as sam malone would be quite a big face yeah he would, he would be like luke han or, or leia in that um and you know, so you've got all these sitcom tropes brilliantly woven into this whole ethical idea as well and i just think to do all of that layering is it, it, yeah it, it boggles my mind yeah um how much they did it and I, I suppose actually that ties into the fact that they weren't ethics um majors they weren't like you know the, the simpsons who are all in some way influenced by maths and, and physics and stuff there's mm. a lot of a lot of the writers on that have a maths and physics background mm. which is why you get a lot of jokes that are very nuanced in ways around those types of um why are you looking at me like i have no idea <laughs> oh, really? yeah. Yeah. Oh, no wonder I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in, in terms of this, I think if it had had loads of ethics possessors, it would have lost that train. And it, it, it's actually kind of running on two different tracks. And yeah. I, I really enjoy that side of it. Mm. So. Yeah, I, that's, that's one of the things I love about it as well. But I also love, I love how conceptually, and you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, you, you, t- you touched this earlier, Joe, that, that uh, it, it's, it's very much about cliffhangers. And it's very much subverting what sitcoms are usually meant to do, which is return to the norm every single week. You know, Marge, my dear, I haven't learned a thing. You know, Seinfeld <laughs> is the sitcom about nothing. Where you know, <laughs> they're pretty much they're pretty much the same people at the end of that that show as they are at the beginning of the show. And I remember once reading something about how growth is the enemy of sitcoms because you want your characters to wither, you want your characters to atrophy, you don't want them to grow because when they grow. They start doing things like they become boring. They, you know, they get boring conventional lives. They grow up. They get married. They, they fall in love. They get married. They get divorced. They have kids. <laughs> and none of that is particularly fertile ground for comedy. I think you can yeah. maybe look at the way that you know, friends maybe started to decline when the characters started growing up and falling in love and having kids. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I am one of those few people who will go to bat a little bit for the Big Bang Theory. But even then, as this, its characters are getting older and wiser, the, it, there's less fertile ground for comedy. Um, so that's what sitcoms are meant to be. But what mm. the Good Place does is it takes it and, and takes the idea of growth and it pushes it in a completely insane direction. Not just with the cliffhanger that ends each episode, which is great for binge watching, by the way, if you're catching up on Netflix. <laughs> but the idea that it just burns through so much story and so much plot and pushes the characters into weird and wacky and crazy and unexpected directions and just when you think you've got a handle on where it's going to go it sips in the other direction and uh, i love that it's got it's got the rhythms of a really great unpredictable thriller 
Yeah. And the, but the, uh, the 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 laughs of an amazing comedy. That first, so that pilot episode of season one, as you said, uh, the Drew Goddard directed one, and it so much is packed into it. I, I'd actually forgotten how much happens in just the pilot, mm. and then you get that amazing cliffhanger ending, and then in it just twenty minutes. Yeah, and it consistently delivers that. And uh, I mean, I think we should get onto it. I feel like season one is absolutely almost perfect it, it, it the thriller aspect the continual jokes uh bringing everything back you know delivering on the ongoing uh plot lines and narratives and the character arcs and everything season two continues that for the most part mm-hmm. i i personally found season three problematic mm-hmm. and i i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it, it does lose that sitcom trope at the beginning where it splits everyone up and it's kind of mixing around it splits uh jamil and jason off and it splits and it, everyone's a bit kind of o- across the globe as it were yeah and i i really struggled to keep invested in everyone's story arc yeah. whilst they're also bringing in so many new ideas about humanity and the idea of uh can anyone truly be good? You know, all of these ideas are coming as well. And I just, I just lost that desire for the next episode, which I had in season one and season two. Discuss. No, no I, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I was just waiting for the pregnant pause. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I totally agree. I think season three is the first time where the, um, that, that burning drive and the energy and the, the ability to burn through much story in, various episodes you know mm. to the point where in season two we thought the season two was going to be about you know eleanor and the the rest of the gang trying to live within the good place yeah. with the knowledge that they have and not tip anyone off about that knowledge and it would be basically just a repeat of of um of season one yeah. and within three episodes the status quo changed completely it has from my money the best episode of the sitcom dan stan's resolution uh, where it has this <laughs> incredible Groundhog Day on acid. That's a horrible phrase. I hate using that. It's so cliche, but, you know, <laughs> what can you do? It, it, this amazing just, you know, re- reboot after reboot after reboot after reboot in the same episode. That's incredible. And it burns through it so, so quickly and goes in directions you don't expect. That by season three, I felt that maybe they'd run out of story a little bit. And that maybe for the first time, I've always felt that Mike Sure. Because I think he has a seven-season plan for this show. Really? I think I read that somewhere. I may have wow. made it up. If I made it up. <laughs> I mean, I'm here for it. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how he has a seven-season plan for the show, if indeed he does. Because I felt that this was a season where it was maybe treading water a little bit. Uh, I felt this was a season where it, it was a little bit creatively uncertain. And mm. the all the stuff in Australia. Yeah just felt for me a little bit forced i don't really like the direction that some of the characters took in in this season and even though i think it got it back towards the end a little bit i think the last three or four episodes were really really funny uh yeah. the last episode for me just didn't work and for me one of the weaknesses of some of mike sure's sitcoms is the enforced partnership and the idea that the already enforced coupling of characters and so sometimes they'll just throw characters together for no good reason other than that maybe they feel the story demands it or maybe that's what people want to see back home maybe shippers or stanners or stan shippers or or whatever they call them want to see these characters together so it leads to terrible terrible things like Mm. um tom and ann perkins getting together for a while in parks and recreation um all those episodes should be scrubbed and uh, thrown into the sea and I really want to like, I really want to get behind the concept and the notion of Chidi and Eleanor as this couple, this grand couple soulmates who mm. um, have been, whose, whose union has been predestined and preordained from the dawn of time to save mankind. But I can't, I can't mm. get behind it because I don't feel it. I don't feel it in the chemistry between the two actors. I don't feel it in the chemistry between the two characters. And so you're asking me to suddenly pirouette from laughing at the show to crying yeah. at the show at the end of season three i i just can't go there i am um, i have a slightly different take on that because okay. i was um, i mean I, I am prone to ship <laughs> <laughs> um, <X-Files> fair. <laughs> but um 
So I was like really behind the idea of them two for season one. Uh-huh. I think there was, I, I actually do feel there's a bit of chemistry there, or at least they made it happen. But the two with the coupling at this point, or with the enforced breakup, I guess now, they're not the same characters now that they were in season one. Mm-hmm. They've been rebooted so many times yeah. and they've lived different lives since then. Yes. So that's my issue with that. But but, th- but this this version, sorry, uh, this this version of Chidi and Eleanor have been around. They had their memories wiped. They've had their memories wiped multiple, multiple times. And they've been rebooted multiple times as well. And so mm. this idea that, that Eleanor has that she and Chidi are somehow in love and somehow are meant to be when they've only really known each other for five minutes, she's been a little bit more aware of things. She's had more insight into their history together. But her idea that she loves him comes from seeing a glimpse of one of her past lives where she loved him. I don't think yeah. it really comes from a place now where that love is organic and has had a really uh, 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 and has grown organically. You know, it's this version of, really, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean the version of Chidi that's in season three that ultimately gets his mind wiped is the version of Chidi that goes that, that falls in love with Simone. And he moves on from Simone very quickly <laughs> to say, you know uh, that i always found i just found it a little bit hard hard to swallow and believe me i think they have chemistry together in spades comedically i think they're great together as as sparring bickering soulmates but mm. when they're doing the lovey-dovey stuff i don't that that sort of i i just don't i don't buy that um but hopefully season four i will buy it because clearly that's where mike sure wants it to go yeah and uh, it's like you said earlier of once they started season two and we've got an idea where we're all thinking season three is going to go mm-hmm. following that ending, which, you know, with the whole, the actual good place and the, you know, all, all of that stuff. But we're, I'm imagining that the writers and Michael shirt, it's, it's going to subvert it again. So we're, we're, we're maybe not going to have to um, embrace that love mm. coupling in the same way that we maybe are thinking of with how they left it. Because it, it did feel forced. It felt, you know, a bit like um, Joey proposing by accident to Rachel. But then, oh my god! You know, <laughs> and it forming it forming the whole season's worth of thing and oh. you know, of, of um, emotional investment. And I yeah. feel like that that's what's happened here. Of they've kind of fallen into that by accident, mm. and then they're also really enjoying all of these other characters. You're not even getting that real emotional time and engagement with those two characters because. Everyone else is off doing adventures. You know, you've got the whole um, Doug Fawcett coming in. You know, you've got <laughs> all of this, and and that's brilliant. And that's that's what I found so upsetting about season three is there's some absolute gems. You know, some of the ideas in there that they they brought into play of you know just living a daily life in 2019, mm. you know, just buying a packet of crisps, buying milk, uh, shopping from an ethical brand. Everything is causing shit and destruction. I, I, so much of that was brilliant yeah it kind of got lost because then they kept going oh we've got to get back to the uh the love thing and it yeah it, lo- it that's where i've really felt it lost it for me of but can you really have a show about philosophy without dealing with love i mean but i think it was that was supposed to be a comical <laughs> comment but it didn't really come <laughs> um yeah <laughs> but you've also had that you know you got the janet jamil i'm amusing Tahani, Tahani, and jason mm. Love kind triangle, of, not really triangle not, kind yeah. of thing, and again, it just that would have been more interesting, I think, to actually br- bring a bit more focus into that, bring a bit more of, of um, Janet's story up to yeah. the fore. But I think she's absolutely brilliant. No, yeah, actually, the, one of the parts that I've really loved about season three, and I think I loved it more than you did, Jay, <laughs> um, is uh, is that whole dealing with like the sort of the politics of the let's just call it the afterlife without any denomination applied <laughs> um where you've got the good place the bad place you've got the janets you've got maya rudolph as the judge who i love Jeez. um and i loved seeing how, how all of that works and integrates like this thing with the whole there's a doorman with a key to the world and they can all like interact with each other and they've got this stuff and then like janet's got this whole separate void area that's separate to all of that mm. like, i loved all the politics and the ideas that are coming in there mm. but are you saying you like the sci-fi <laughs> I love, of course i love the sci-fi um, 
but yeah it's I, I think there's so much there and I think personally my theory is that season three at least in the UK suffered from it being the first season that the majority of viewers over the, in the, on this side of the Atlantic watching it week by week mm, whereas yeah. the previous two seasons most a lot of people in the UK binged it on Netflix absolutely yeah and I think seeing it each week and having to remember what happened in the previous episode because it's not a normal sitcom yeah has actually damaged it slightly really damaged the viewing appeal that's a really that's a really good point i mean i i but i did watch season two was like that for me when i discovered the good place i discovered it i i'd heard really good great things about it regrettably Mm -hmm. sadly i knew the big twist going into my first viewing of it um, really? Because yeah, well, I I had just stumbled upon. I was I was reading an Alan Seppenwall column about another show, and and, it, and he went oh, and there was another link to interviews Ted Danson about the Good Place, and I clicked on that, and it was then <laughs> talking about the twist, and I was like oh that that sounds cool, and I kind of put it <laughs> on the back of my mind because it hadn't come over here, and then uh, a friend of mine, I think it might have been even Nick from Empire here was 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 kind of raving about it. And so I had a flight to New York and I just downloaded it all 13 episodes onto my onto my Netflix on on the plane and just absolutely buzzed through them. And yeah. it's Are you still of, watching Netflix? Yes. <laughs> yeah, go yeah, next episode, next episode. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I had recently I had that experience like that with Barry as well where it was just uh, and Barry is a little bit like that as well in that it's it's a kind of a sitcom, obviously more overtly dramatic. But it yeah. also has a cliffhanger. Each episode has a cliffhanger. You have to watch it. Uh, mm. But I buzzed through it, came home a few days later, and then buzzed through it again with my wife. I said, you have to see the show. She didn't know the twist, which was great. Uh, but the second season I watched like that, and I couldn't wait. Every episode delivered for me. And mm. season three, it just faltered. And season yeah. three is the first, the first time, and this happened about four or five episodes in, uh, where I would get up, I think it, it was every Friday at 8 a.m., that's when a new episode would drop on Netflix. Yes. And about five episodes in, I was just like, usually I would get up and I would watch it at 8 o'clock. I would watch the first episode, uh, the new episode. Mm-hmm. And five episodes in, I, I just didn't have that, that drive. I just didn't have the impetus to do that. And I would get round to watching the episode eventually. Mm-hmm. Even when they began to pick up in terms of quality, I just didn't really have that drive. And I would watch season four, because I trust in my sure and I trust in the show. But mm. if I, I feel if season four for me is quality wise akin to season three, then uh, I might stop watching it. And I know a few people who have stopped watching it. It's, it's so interesting because um, as we're recording this, Fleabag has just finished season two mm. and Phoebe waller has come out and said, that's it. That's your lot. Done. Yeah. Two series. Yeah. You know, The Office, 40 Towers. Th- there's a precedent for it. And, I find it's it precedent in the UK. For well, yeah, it. exactly. And I find it difficult because there are shows like the American Office, um, like Parks and Rec, that are so they're almost like a tonic. You know, you just put it on. It's like ah, oh, I can just relax and not really care. And there's some jokes and stuff. But when it's so good for season one and season two, that when you have that drop off point, it really does. And I'm 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 kind of with um, with you on that of. I really struggled to get through season three. You, but you you're were... married to me, so you have to watch it. <laughs> I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Wait, this is a bad place. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this is an insight into. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but, um, it's it, and I think maybe again this comes from that high concept aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. Um, something like Red Dwarf, which was quite a high concept for its time of, uh, you know, sci-fi, and you have to kind of know a little bit about yeah. what's going on in order to enjoy it. Yeah. And I feel like that had, um, okay, no, series three of that was the pinnacle probably. Mm-hmm. So, but then once it drops off, and you really feel when it drops off, and you really yeah. have this kind of like. A, a bit of a fuck you, you know. I was really <laughs> enjoying that. So you're saying that you, you're expecting more from, from a high concept sitcom than from yeah. a standard Absolutely. life one. Something like Modern Family, I don't expect much. It's when it's good, <laughs> it's great. No, no, but when it's good, it's a really enjoyable watch. Uh-huh. But I'm not sat there kind of expecting to be wowed. And you're not expecting like new revelations about a universe. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. 
maybe, you know, <laughs> South America I've not been to. So <laughs> when, when they go there on holiday, that's, that's a new <laughs> thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting thing for me of when you have that fuck you moment with, sorry, fork you moment with a mm. sitcom. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to have that with this because I feel oh, it was... Because it's so good. There's yeah. so much goodness in there. And mm. I, I think, yeah, season three is not his best season, obviously. But I, I'm, I'm with you there, Chris. Like, I will watch season four and I really am rooting for it. I, mm. I really want it to be awesome again. Yeah. Um, Bring Diane back from Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did in Modern Family. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Crossover. <laughs> Absolutely. But the the thing that worries me uh, going forward is going back to The Good Place, the podcast. And if you listen to the season three episodes of that show, they think Mm. they've knocked it out of the park. And I know those episodes were recorded before the shows aired. So they were recorded Mm. before Mm. there was a sort of bit of a backlash or, you know, some people were were, were very negative about it. Mm. But if you listen to it and you listen to the Mike Shure interview at the end of it and you listen to interviews with other writers uh, throughout the show, they feel that they've really delivered on season three. And that is great that confidence is fantastic but that also worries me a little bit and i hope that maybe they can take some criticism on board and some feedback on board and and maybe reshape for season four but then as you say like earlier you were mentioning like the whole shipping thing Mm -hmm. and i think we've got this really interesting time in in culture where there's such a direct line to uh create creators um Mm. that maybe wasn't there you know Joe, massive X-Files fan. Chris Carter didn't hear or know shit for, for a lot of the early... If social ep- media had existed, he would have had a lot. Exactly. <laughs> and I just think sometimes it's wonderful, but then you're seeing it a lot with films and you're seeing it a lot with TV, definitely, of is this shaping? So is there a whole swathe of people that are just shipping GD and Eleanor? And oh, I've seen it on Twitter, yeah. definitely. There are some huge... Chitty and Eleanor. I don't, I don't know what the. Uh, oh my goodness! <laughs> what's the word called? A pa- oh, what's the what's that grammatical word? Shipping. No. Yeah. When you put two words together and make a new one. Oh, oh lord. Portmanteau. Uh, yes. What, I don't you. know what the portmanteau yes. is for. Oh, that's good with that. Chidana. Uh, <laughs> Ch- Chalanor. Chalanor. Ch- yeah. Yeah, that yeah. works. Ch- 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 Chalanor. Uh, Ed. There we Easy, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I, I can see that as well. But I also think that if you um, look at how this show is made, if you look at something mm. like, say, Moonlighting, where eventually you know David and Maddie got together, um, that was, I think, partially a reaction to week by week reactions to the show. People were going, "We yeah. love these people. We have to get them together." Season three of The Good Place was made in a bubble. It was written in the bubble. It was filmed in a bubble. Edited in a bubble. So by the time mm-hmm. The show is aired. It's done. And they're not going to go back and, and change it. So yeah. I think the course they've set out on is a course they want to set out on. And that is what worries me, quite frankly, uh, going forward. It's kind of like the the last season of How I Met Your Mother, which oh my lot, God. a lot of fans absolutely hate because it was made in... They, they had the story all written out. They didn't, they was never going to change it because it was there from episode one. And maybe if you're saying that Michael Schur has a seven season planned out. He's not going to change. And we have to kind of ride that if we want to or not. <laughs> Question is, of course, will he get there? And and whether whether or not they, they, if, for example, the ratings start to plummet or it starts to become, if it starts to feel less culturally vital and it does, then perhaps NBC will, will say, it is NBC, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it's NBC. Yeah, it well, is, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they'll step in and they'll go, yeah, seven seasons, not so much, but you'll have five. You can finish on five. Well, and so then maybe NBC he can. Who cancelled Brooklyn Nine Nine? Yeah, yeah, it was. It? Yeah, it was yeah. Fox, yeah, uh, Fox cancelled Brooklyn Nine Nine, and then NBC picked and it NBC up. Picked oh, up. They picked yeah. up. They really yeah. like Michael Shea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, really, really do. Okay, um, so Chris, um, yes. just to put you on the spot here, mm. do you have a uh, favorite joke or like piece of writing in the show that is a standout for you that you go? That's that's the good place that I know. <laughs> um, I, I, um, yeah. Oh, Lord. Let me see. Let me see. I there's a lot of great Jason Mendoza moments that I that I love. 
Yes. And I think it's really hard to write stupid well. Yes. And they do it so so well. He's basically <laughs> he's basically a puppy. And <laughs> there's there's an amazing moment. It's not necessarily a bit of writing, but there's an amazing moment for it. And it's from an episode of this season, actually, in season three. But there's an amazing moment where he and Pillboy oh. say the saddest farewell yeah. possible. And they have the most convoluted handshake. And if you listen to the Good Place podcast that uh, Manny Yacinto and the actor who plays Bill Boy, whose name I've forgotten, um, mm. they actually had like maybe an hour to come up with that handshake themselves. But that, for me, is quintessentially um, uh, Jason Mendoza. It's amazing. Yeah, I like that it does those absurd, absurd moments alongside the clever moments, alongside the emotional moments. And that's, I think that's when I love a sitcom is when you have all of the different types of comedy on display at different point, uh, points. Like you started this, uh, this episode, uh, this podcast talking about uh, Monty Python. Mm. And I think when you have a sitcom that can do that, you know, Frasier for some reason springs to mind where it can do a really highbrow joke, a uh, toilet humor joke, a beautiful moment of slapstick farce, a beautiful absurdist joke. And I, I think something when it really nails all of that is, um, yeah, I, I love that when sitcoms can do that. Yeah, oh, there's, yeah. there's lots of different brands of comedy within mm. The Good Place. Yeah. I think mine, in terms of writing, is season one, I believe it is, when they're shutting down Janet and she has the fail safe of. I'm, and she just goes through all these different ways of like. The emotional I'm, triggers. <laughs> I have three children and holds out the picture of her children. And it's just, it's yeah. so. Br- and I'm pregnant with your child. It's your. It's just, <laughs> it's so. It's such an interesting. It's so unique dark as well. <laughs> yes, I love I love uh, the bit where she goes. I've just got tickets for Hamilton, and I hear David Diggs is coming back. <laughs> 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 so, the thing is, I, though, when we rewatch this show in like ten, fifteen years, will that be recognizable? Will I? Will, I don't mm. know. I mean, obviously Hannibal, I'm sure will endure, but certain things like that will they be understood by younger audiences coming up and re rewatching? Like, like things like you know, like. Um, younger generation now watching friends mm. there's not a lot of um contemporary references in that show not at all. whereas this does have a few of them and that's going to be a bit bewildering i think <laughs> sorry who <laughs> but it's also i think um uh, listening to the good place podcast and seeing some uh, uh video video talks on online about uh, the good place i think it has a bit of that um oh shit who, who directed uh, anchorman and all of that Adam McKay. Adam McKay. Yeah. I think there's an element of that to a lot of um, Michael Schur's shows because there are moments and blooper reels of Janet and Ted Danson going through, like uh, they do on Anchorman, a siphon of different phrases. So when she's holding up the basketball and it's all of these alts and that moment with Janet with the um, shutdown button yeah. feels like they've just gone, we'll just use them all. Yeah. <laughs> They're all yeah. good and and that that's kind of got that Anchorman feel because Anchorman feels like it's just let's just put every all in like, Simil- <laughs> and then make another film out of all the other all. Like. Similarly with the uh, with Eleanor when she with the various this is the bad place moments. Yeah. Now obviously they they're all purposely filmed, but it's like the writers' room alts. But they've yeah. gone just throw them all in. Everyone have a go. Everyone have a go. Yeah. And uh, I love them because they're all so fucking absurd mm. like there'll be like one in a field with loads of balloons and yeah. then there's like they're all dressed in black at, i'm guessing <laughs> a funeral but they're already dead and there's all this stuff like really random shit i i love that brilliant it is amazing i love um i love also there's a, a great line um from michael where he's going through a sort of checklist of things that people have done in the in the, uh, in their past lives you know to to Oh, to, the, to yeah. make sure whether they're going to the good place or the bad place, and he goes, "Have you ever paid money to see to see music performed by the Californian funk band Red Hot Chili Peppers?" <laughs> um, I love that. That's amazing, uh, especially since I'm a fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, exactly. and clearly I'm going to go to the bad place. So. Yeah, oh, we're all going. <laughs> Um, uh, there's also there's a lot of like traffic violation type <laughs> things i feel like obviously um, these guys the writers all live in la and oh yeah <laughs> which is renowned for its traffic issues and so many of those like points based things are like allowing someone to merge and um, like things like that <laughs> but even just like um even the swearing you know one of the earliest jokes in the you know real real laugh out loud jokes 
and I think that they're so well crafted because you have to choose the the right word with the right mundanity, like shirt and walking and bench bench yeah mm. and it's got to have that mundanity to it and we were trying to come up with cunt oh my word what would the yeah. uh <laughs> so what would the good place <laughs> version of cunt be and it's quite difficult to actually like to, to come up with a word that's got that mundanity of custard you, you, you could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think you got it yeah well, it's, <laughs> it's got to be Emmanuel. phonetically it's got to be phonetically the same, hasn't it? Yeah. So you couldn't you couldn't just go farage. Yeah. You'd have, <laughs> it has oh, to sound, perfect. but it's so yeah. <laughs> yeah. It has to sound like that. It has to sound like that. It, it probably is just count or Clint yeah. or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Which reminds me, actually, I don't know why this has popped into my head, but uh, I don't know if you guys remember this a few years ago, where Mark Miller, the the Scottish comic book writer, mm. uh, the guy who created Kick Ass and Kingsman and all that sort of stuff. Um, oh, the magazine, he, yeah. The, he produced a magazine called Clint. Clint and yeah. he had, he deliberately made the kerning, there's a hot word, the kerning <laughs> of the, the title of the magazine look like cunt. Yeah. Um, so so he, he just got a little laugh, a little infantile, puerile laugh out of the fact that people could go into the news agent and do a double take. The same as you do with the SFX. Sometimes you go, I'd like a copy of Sex Magazine, yeah. please. And while I'm here, I might as well double down with a cunt. <laughs> I used to be so embarrassed when I was uh, buying copies of of SFX as a child, as a teenager, because they'd always like place, I don't know, um, a Zinger Warrior Princess's oh. head right over the like where the bottom part of the oh, where yeah. you think yeah. an E would be. Um, so you could go to the counter with a copy of SFX, going, "It's not sex." <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, for me, it was Small Soldiers, <laughs> that classic Joe Dante film. Yes. Um, the typeface on that at the end, and one of the stars of that was, I think, Clint Mansell. Or no, it wasn't Clint Mansell. He's a, he's a, <laughs> uh, but it, his name was Clint something. And I just remember finishing that and seeing this word on the screen and at the yeah. cinema, I'm going, "That's a rude word." And coming, out <laughs> and his name is cunt. Like, Age <laughs> twelve. And uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't. It was Clint. But <laughs> the, the yeah. typeface on Small Soldiers again had that that kerning issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it took me ages to realize that as well, because obviously as a man, I'm terrible at finding the Clint. So <laughs> oh. what can you do? I think we've got <laughs> off topic. Um... <laughs> okay. <I> specialize in. <laughs> yeah. So um, a couple more um, things I just want to kind of want to work out about the good place. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels very much of the era. Yeah. It feels very much a progressive, 2010s kind of thing going. Oh, uh, I'm wondering. Well, I, I'm wondering. Ugh, like I haven't prepared these. <laughs> we are wondering. Here, here's a thought: Could the premise have worked before 2016 when it was released? Because I feel like this whole you know, the concept of mindfulness and growth and things like that. Like, what you were talking earlier about um, how growth was the enemy of sitcoms. I think yeah. it's a uh, woke. Sorry, yeah, and it's kind of woke. <laughs> that works, yeah. work, work AF. Um, yeah, <laughs> would this have worked before now? Is this just the perfect time for it? Mm. I think it, yeah, it's a bit of both. I actually think uh, yeah, it it, it could have worked. Something like this absolutely could have worked. Um, but a lot of the sitcoms I absolutely adored that I, I grew up with were all very very mean, <laughs> nasty minded, and this is uh, such a wonderful pure progressive sitcom as you say. But I'm thinking back to like the uh, to the 80s and the 90s and sitcoms I loved like Bottom and Blackadder, um, where the the heroes were black hearted cads who never really learned anything about themselves Absolutely. and never really progressed as people. Um, would the Good Place have worked in that environment? I'm not so sure it would. And but I don't think it's anything to do with the personalities or the characters or or the uh, the philosophy. I think it would have been because the effects would have sucked. <laughs> and we would have all remembered that terrible sitcom with uh, where people you know flew and yeah. became multiple clones themselves and the effects were so so bad that it lasted six episodes like super that's, what, that's what i feel yeah <laughs> it's really like a really shit doctor who or something i, don't, I can't even imagine like, like super gram i don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. <like> super gram <laughs> um so we're also, saying... also haunt me if you want to go back to <laughs> effects driven sitcoms so we're saying the good place is a sequel to the good life with special effects Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Coming coming full circle, um, 
in terms of what, what you you talked about what you watched before um obviously good place has been a favorite of yours for some mm-hmm. seasons is there anything else in terms of sitcoms that you, you know is absolute must tune tune in for you at the moment because i feel like we talked we talked around it but whether it's because it's um, viewing platforms, whether it's because it's binge watching rather than uh, weekly tune-ins, whether it's just because we're all older now and we're not uh, watching Friends on a Friday night uh, yeah. when we're at school or college, do you feel that there are still sitcoms that are you know, water cooler fodder? Yeah, I absolutely do. I think um, Fleabag has proved that as well, which is really interesting given that... Uh, it's on what, BBC Three. <laughs> so not that many people really can be watching Fleabag. So maybe I'm wondering if that's maybe a little bit of a media bubble thing. That some people are picking up the newspapers and going, everyone's talking about Fleabag, are they? Yeah. I've never heard of it. <laughs> it almost feels like we're in a golden age at the moment with things like, you know, yes, I've ragged a little bit in season three of The Good Place, but it is still an incredible comedy. And mm. it is still one of the best sitcoms uh, to come out of the States in a long, long time. Uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is tremendous. Yeah. Um, I think right now, Dairy Girls is as good as it gets for me, and yeah, yeah, and Dairy Girls, Dairy Girls, Fleet by Good Place, Happy Days, well, Happy Days is also great <laughs> until it jumps the shark. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you want to start jumping the shark, oh uh, god, it gets us on to the rest of development, and we'll be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> I think those sound effects literally say more than anything we can say about rest of development right now, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I think that's the perfect way to wrap up. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Where can our listeners find you online? Uh, They can find me online. Uh, I have a GPS tracker, so they can just track me 24 (laughs) hours a day. Uh, I'm behind one of them right now, and he is completely unaware. (laughs) Oh, wait, no, he's turned around. Oh, shit, this is awkward. Um, So, Or they can find me on Twitter, it's at Chris Hewitt, and they can find uh, me every Friday on the empire podcast and keep them peeled for specials as well but yeah thank you so much mate and um we we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat all things good place thank you uh also a big thank you to our listeners and if you like what you heard please throw us a rating and review on apple podcasts and we'll be back for more state of the sitcom next time Goodbye. thanks chris thanks chris thank you very much now go do something good <laughs>